Uh, Rain, I want to start off by actually, this is very James Lipton-y of me, uh, forgive me, but um, I want to start off by, um, if I can find my note here, uh, read, well, okay, here it is. Uh, I want to read a quote from your book and okay. ask you about it. Is it about when the worms came out of my butt? <laughs> well, that was a follow-up question. Okay. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yeah, what did you eat? No. Um, okay, so here it goes. Uh, no matter how many times you've played a role, every single performance is an uh, excavation, a rehearsal in front of an audience where you play, dig, explore, and unleash your spontaneity to bring uh, fresh vitality to the character and an unpredictable magic to every moment. Um, I, for me, I think this really transcends acting. Uh, can you uh, just tell us, like, what, what did you, you know, how do you live by that? Is that a philosophy or just an approach towards your craft, or what does that mean to you? Well, I, I hadn't uh, thought about it in terms of uh, uh, translating to, to one's life, but I, I think that's, that's, an interesting, uh, that's an interesting way to, uh, to explore the quote. Yeah, I, I more meant it in... Um, in terms of uh, theater and acting, mm -hmm. and just a philosophy that I do in terms of my craft. Um, so I uh, uh, I went to acting school uh, at NYU in the graduate acting program, and um, uh, really dug into um, into the into the craft of yeah. acting. And I think that a lot of a mistake that a lot of actors fall into, um, especially theater actors, is they fall into like well, I'm gonna rehearse this much and then I'm gonna figure out my performance almost as quickly as possible. Like in a week and a half, people will have their performances set, mm -hmm. how they're going to say every single line, you know, what my performance is. They do it in a mirror or in their closet or what have you. And um, so this is just a different way of looking at it that, you know, the, the, the kind of the magic and the miracle of acting is that you get to uh, explore um, every moment and live each moment as if for the first time. Yeah. I'm doing a play, The Doppelganger, at Steppenwolf right now, and my job is to live fully in the shoes of the character, in the skin of the character. And to, if you say something to me, I'm hearing it for the first time and I'm responding for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and before I start a play, before I start a performance, I think about like, what do I want to explore that night? What do right. I, what's my, What's my way in? What's what's my focus going to be? So that um, I also have kind of a an overdrive, a, a super objective going on as well as the kind of minutia of the moment to moment stuff. So uh, to me, that's what makes acting really exciting is that it's fresh and it's spontaneous and it's alive. And that's what you see in really good acting. And what you see in really bad acting is tense, yeah. calculated, intellectualized, preset, over-rehearsed, you know, all of those kind of things. So, um, you know, I think improv is a great training in this way as well. Yeah. It has some pitfalls, but I think that, uh, you know, so many Chicago actors work in Second City and in improv, and, and it gives that that nice kind of, like, buoyancy uh, to the work. And that, that's the, the great thing about improv, especially at Second City, um, where, oh, uh, just coincidentally, um, shameless plug, uh, DePaul has uh, created a new program where we have partnered with uh, the Second City's Fer Harold Ramis Film School in uh, a concentration in, in uh, comedy. But uh, one of the, the philosophies of, um, of improv that we learned at Second City is uh, discovery. There's so much discovery in, and not just something that you're doing off the cuff um, as an improvisation, but is that something that, that you take uh, in doing live theater or, or doing films and television where, you know, uh, uh, you've got the Meg coming out, which I, I'm making an assumption with a huge, big budget production, there are probably more than five or six takes in, in a few different setups. 
Yeah, well, you'd be surprised. He moved pretty quick. Oh, so really? there was there was not a whole lot of takes. Yeah. Okay. It was, uh, it was three three or four takes. Well, that per setup. shoots that that setup that yeah. hell. Out. Um, but what I wanted to ask you is that um, with with discovering things, are you discovering, say, like in a scene that uh, or or in a play that you're doing, uh, you know, multiple times. When you are doing your performance, are you observing new things in within the show, like uh, reactions uh, to your fellow actors or into the environment, or is it is it sort of a uh, an unspoken thing that you're you're kind of thinking about your character as you're performing it or backstory? How do you how do you approach that? Well, you're really talking about a kind of a deep dive into the craft of acting. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it should be said for the audience that, um, like before I did, obviously I'm well known for The Office, but I did 10 years of theater before I did any TV or film. Yeah. So I was doing uh, regional theater and, and local theater and off-Broadway and Broadway stuff and, and little workshops. and. Um, Tours and Shakespeare and, and and stuff like that. So I'm I'm not speaking necessarily as a sitcom actor, but just speaking over you know an almost 30 year acting career. Not to sound pretentious, but that's that's kind of what I'm addressing when I'm talking about the craft, mm -hmm. not so much just the office itself. Um, but I would say, uh, yeah, the uh, the you I believe in the kind of the old school way of looking at acting, which is uh, you have your character's intention, you know, and. Is that you, what you build it on? You build it around that? Absolutely, I do, yeah. And it it, it can never let you down to play intentionality uh, as an actor. Are there any actors out here? Any? One. One? There's one actor. <laughs> wow. What are you guys, like, ec oh, what, we've accounting got... majors or what? <laughs> we've got writers, directors, producers, cinematographers. Okay, all right. So. Um, but they should know as filmmakers, you know, in working with actors that um, the intention is, is, is a perfect way of, of looking at work. Because if, mm -hmm. if, if my intention is to get you, Chris, out of this room, right, if that's my intention, there's a thousand ways to get a person out of a room. Mm -hmm. Certainly you can yell at them, but you can also seduce them out of the room, coax them out of the room, bribe them out of the room, ice them out of the room. And that just depends on, on the character you're playing and how you, how you get them out of the room is, is the character. So what you want and then and how you do it. So as you learn and work on your character, you learn, oh, my, my character would and wouldn't do that. This is the technique my character would use mm -hmm. to get you, you know, out of, out of the room. Is that the approach that you but take? But it doesn't, but sorry, because it, it doesn't, then it doesn't set any lines. There's not any line readings. You know, if the right. line is like, get out of here, you know, Bad acting is to preset how that line is going to go. Mm -hmm. And so you're gonna say, get out of here! And it's just gonna ring wrong to the human ear because it's not really connected. We play intentions all the time. We, we're constantly doing intentions yeah. um, in our lives. And that, you know, that also kind of helps a little bit more with the subtext as well, where mm -hmm. it, it isn't such on the nose type of performances, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, you, you directed just The Office alone, you directed three episodes of The Office. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you about Classy Christmas later on, which I, I love. It's one of my favorites. Um, but in, um, in working in front of the camera and behind the camera, is that, is that an approach you take when working with actors as a director? Do you, do you start with the intention of... of what the character is doing when you're directing them, or how do you, what approach uh, do you take? Like specifically, what I want to ask you is, what have you learned in um, as as an actor that uh, you've translated into uh, working as a director? How is how is being an actor um, kind of changed or or uh, influenced how you direct? Well, I, I don't have enough technique as a director to even really be able to speak about directing or how to direct or how I direct. 
you know, I was going into a very well-oiled machine. Okay. So I, you know, the first episode I directed, we were already, you know, 120 episodes in. So oh, the, wow. the camera people know what they're doing. The writers know what they're doing. The actors all know their characters and stuff like that. It makes it very easy. But it was a very valuable experience for me um, to to try and do that. But, um, you know, I think the the director's... Um, the director's main objective is different than the actor's objective. I don't. Um, I'm not sure how much discovery a director is doing um, in terms of, in you know, moment to moment stuff. The director is trying to tell a story visually, so it's, you know, there's all kinds of tools one uses to tell a story, right? right? So you, you have where the camera is placed and does the camera move and what kind of lens are you on and. How is the movement of the actors in front of the lens or behind the lens? How do you, you know, you're, you want to create a, a, a visceral movement so that a story is unfolding in the most natural way possible. Um, and of course the office had a certain kind of style, that, sure. that cinema verite kind of style. Um, but I think the, that where it does help is, you know, for a show like The Office and in many movies, the, the most important shot is just this and just someone having a conversation and the coverage of that conversation mm -hmm. and um, you know making sure that um, that 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 actor is is really listening right. and um, exploring in a new fun and, and fresh way and um, where the actor can surprise themselves and surprise you and um, I think that is a great skill of a director is to allow themselves to be surprised. When the, when I've worked with the really great directors, they'll they'll go off of um, they may have it storyboarded, but they'll discover things in the moment and then go with that and go down that. Do you mean like a spontaneity in going off script or a, a spontaneity in terms of um, allowing? Um, uh, allowing some moment that the actor discovers to bring fresh life to the scene that they had not planned hitherto. Does that mean finding a different emotional moment that may have not been planned before? Or Sure, it could be that, yeah. Mm -hmm. It could be a different line, it could be a movement, it could be something in the blocking, it could be um, something in the actor's physicality, it could be something in the, you know, you're going to a new location, you're gonna film something in a theater and you have this crazy carpet and <laughs> One of the actors is sitting on the carpet and like, let's just shoot it on the carpet. You yeah. know, let's, that looks really cool. Let's get that instead of this, you know, in the background, you know, and we'll shoot it from above. Or they, to allow themselves to discover and, and morph in the moment. Now, a good director will know to stay on, not just do that the whole time. They've got to stay on track and tell the story. But um, uh, the really the best directors that I've worked with, you mentioned like James Gunn is that way, Cameron Crowe's that way, to just... Find, find where the where the scene takes them. Yeah. You come in with a really strong point of view, and it's storyboarded, pretty clear what you want, what you need from this scene, and the and the grand arc of the story. Mm -hmm. But not allow yourself to be surprised in all kinds of ways. A friend of mine is a really um, prolific uh, television director, and he had uh, he'd said uh, actually in this chair. He said that uh, one of the most uh, important things about directing, at least in, in direct, directing uh, half-hour television, is being consistent in the tone, uh, being consistent yeah. in the emotional tone of it. Um, what, what, when you direct, or uh, actually, if, if I'm putting you on the spot here, uh, the first time you directed, um, what, are, are there any, is there anything that, that, surprised you that you did not anticipate when you sat in the director's chair for the first time that just something you had would not expect whatsoever no I, I wouldn't no I was not surprised by anything um, but I will say that nothing can really prepare you for how many details you have to look after yeah so which I knew going in so I was not surprised by that but it's kind of like do you want this mug or this mug for the character? You know, <laughs> right, do you want this right. blue bottle or this green bottle? Do you want the camera here? Do you want this light here? Do you want the thing here? Do you want her hair over here? Do you want this blouse or that one? I mean, you have to make, it's just this litany of, of choices. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's an astounding amount of choices that you've been making for months prior to shooting on a film. Yeah. You know, in two months of pre-production, you've been making choices on casting and on locations and on 
what kind of camera and lens you're going to use and um, you know how you're going to shoot it. Are you going to? Is it all going to be? Is it going to be handheld? Is it going to be on sticks? Are you going to use a lot of you know jib arms and sliders and whatnot? How? Uh -huh. um, so uh, it's a staggering amount of choices for a director. So I would say one of the most important skills for someone who's directing is having that kind of really uh, a clear, dispassionate ability to um, really have, here's three or four options, which one helps tell the story the best way, and also trust your instincts uh, about which one will help the story, which, which of those things you like the most, and uh, be able to kind of weed through um, the insane amount of, of choices you have to make. Also, it, um... There's nothing worse than being on a set with a director that can't decide between these two cops. Just like, and God, slowing down know. the day because just, of that. I don't know. What do you What do you think? What, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, it's yeah. So it uh, it's also kind of a beat the clock thing that a lot of people on the outside looking in don't seem to appreciate that that just making your day can be such a challenge. Yeah. It seems. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. So that a director has to have an ability, hopefully with a good producer and a good you know assistant director, mm -hmm. to look at. Okay, I've got this. 10 hours or 12 hours and I've got to get all this done and that you don't get, you know, two thirds of it done really well and then you've got one hour to get the last third, you know, so you've yeah. got, to, you know, you've got have one you hour. Had, have you had to make sacrifices like that before and in, in stuff that you've done where you had to maybe trim a scene or yeah, get as I, much coverage on yeah, something that you wanted? Yeah, I did I did a whole I did a film called Hesher that no one saw with Joseph Gordon Levitt and Natalie Portman. And um, that uh, was we lost whole scenes that they just mm -hmm. the director was really slow and they just had to like cut scenes. And there wasn't yeah. even really a a rhyme or reason to it. It's like we, we what about that one scene? Oh we didn't get to it. Oh. And it's like that's not how you want to work. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. You don't want to just not be able to get to it. You know. Um, so, and the movie suffered from it. Although it's a pretty terrific film. Well, you've worked in just the entire spectrum in terms of budgets uh, for for films. Uh, soup. I I I can't overemphasize this enough. How wonderful! If you guys haven't seen it yet, how wonderful Super is. It's just. It's the most amazing, original, creative, violent uh, superhero movie ever, and Rain is is just and about about a forty percent on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> Screw that. Yeah, <laughs> which is really interesting because I think one thing that young people need to understand is that you just can't go by Rotten Tomatoes because not everything is by uh, is not everything is uh, uh, is to everyone's taste. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Super is really violent. So that means one third of the reviewers are gonna hate it. So then that takes the tomato rating down to here, right? So the more risky a film is, the less its rating is gonna be on Rotten Tomatoes. So you, you know, kids are, you know, young people today are uh, sometimes sheeple in terms of like, it has 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. Well, that just means that it didn't alienate anyone. Yeah. So it's pro yeah. it might be really good, but it might also be kind of bland. Or it might just really stick within its formula in a way. And Super is really hard to categorize. It has a absurd humor and dark violence and weird sex and s strange characters and superheroes. And um, I I'm, there's I'm, some really dramatic and bittersweet moments in it. Yeah, too. Just, yeah, you know, it's heartbreaking moments in the movie. Yeah, and it, it deals with death and loss and insanity and mortality and uh, the nature of violence itself. And it's it's a really brilliant film. Um, I, I was talking to somebody about the movie, and I, I described it as Travis Bickle with a cape. Uh -huh. And it, James Gunn described it as Taxi Driver meets Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> So how could you not like that? Well, <laughs> plenty of critics did not like that. <laughs> well, um, so I want to ask you about uh, working on big budget uh, projects. Uh, you've got the Meg coming out, um, you know, modest budgeted uh, independent stuff. Uh, you know, we, we've heard stories of, of you know, uh, some of the great perks of working on like a big budget movie and different things. Um, but what what are some of the things that independent films that you're experiencing working on independent films 
have uh, been in which you actually you liked that experience or that part of the experience more? What what can an in, working on an independent film offer that uh, big budget films cannot? Well, I mean, there's so many things an independent film offers over a big budget film. Um, as, as, a, as an artist, I mean. Yeah. Uh, so the main thing is because you don't have a lot of budget for special effects, mm -hmm. then the movie itself is focused on character. Yeah. So uh, you as an actor in an independent film, you get to play a, a, a more rich, varied, and uh, individualized character. Uh, usually the language is smarter and the dialogue is smarter. Um, and usually the scenes are more complex and... Um, you know, the Meg, the film that you're describing, is, involves a giant prehistoric shark being being fought by Jason Statham. So, <laughs> the the you know the dialogue does exactly what you think it would need to do for mm -hmm. a movie like that. Um, whereas you know the film Permanent that I did with Patricia Arquette right before it that had a one million dollar budget. Oh, Meg the, is, the wigs, right? The yeah, wigs, yeah, yeah. Meg has a 150, 160 million dollar budget. Oh, um, it was. Uh, so much more uh, fun and engaging, and and uh, not that I didn't have fun on the Meg. It was it was a blast. Mm -hmm. We got to shoot in New Zealand, and the people are all really nice. But um, uh, I, I love doing indie films. It's it's very close to it's close to doing a play. It's like doing oh, really? it's like doing a theater. Yeah, you have a, a a small ensemble of of characters and the going on a journey, and and you're kind of like the seat of the pants kind of filmmaking and. DIY and and everyone pitches in and the conditions are, you know, not luxurious. And uh, is there uh, more of a camaraderie from independent films? Oh, Virginia? definitely. Yeah, definitely. People are not there for the money; they're there yeah. for the for the story. So, um, you've played a lot of antiheroes, and what what about that type of character uh, appeals to you? Um, like you know, for example, with uh, with Super and and with Dwight, they're they're characters that that seem to kind of have their own uh, moral code. Um, is that something that that you look for in a part in a script, or is it something that uh, you find yourself offered more of those roles, or what what is it about about the antihero that uh, that you respond to? Well, um, I guess maybe the first time I've ever heard Dwight described as an anti-hero, but... Uh, the, you don't think so? Well, I hadn't really thought of it in, that, in those terms. I, I, don't, I don't look at it in that sense, Chris. I, I don't... Um, uh, hero or anti-hero, I'm just drawn to um, complicated characters mm -hmm. that have their own way of seeing the world and that are uh, misfits in a way and... Uh, um, and just have an, have an interesting perspective and an interesting kind of twisted journey. I'm yeah. just dr more drawn to those characters. I wouldn't know how to play a well-balanced guy. I wouldn't know, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know how to play a, um, you know, a, yeah, a well-balanced, successful ad executive with a, with a nice wife and kids who's, can't find his car keys or something like that. I wouldn't know. How, I just wouldn't know how to do that. Yeah. And I don't get those roles, nor should I get those roles. Uh, so. Well, they're the most boring roles. They are more boring. Yes. <laughs> I, uh, I I sold this pilot to to Disney Channel a while back, and the thing that was very frustrating with that experience was that um, they kept selling the fact that. Uh, they want aspirational characters, characters that, that kids want to be like and look up to. And I, I, my interpretation of that is, well, oh, that's all well, you know, that's fine and good. I can appreciate that. But it doesn't really seem to lend itself to a whole lot of comedy when someone doesn't have any flaws. Does that make it a more difficult character to play when you've got a character that just doesn't have any flaws? Yeah, I, I remember uh, talking to a director that was um, had written a script for Harrison Ford back in his heyday. Yeah, and uh, they he got a piece of paper from Harrison Ford's agent said, "If you want to submit to Harrison Ford, here's 
here are the kind of roles Harrison Ford plays. And it was like a treatise on Harrison <laughs> Ford. And it was like, he plays a, a heroic man who's had a bit of a troubled past, who wants to do that, <laughs> and it was all like spelled out, what he can and can't do in a Harrison Ford movie. And the guy was just like, well, I can't, I can't deal with that. He's like a writer. It was like a writer, only it was like a character, uh, um, a character writer, you know? So, yeah, I mean, that's the problem with a lot of um, egos in Hollywood is um, people, um, they, they're, they, they become limited by the characters they play and like, I would, I would do that, I would not do that, mm -hmm. you know? And then you just cut out a lot of the character's humanity because you're right, um, comedy comes out of conflict. And then, and that's another thing that a lot of the TV channels want to, they, they want to take the conflict out. Oh, so it's God. like, well, how do, you, how do you create comedy if there's no conflict? If everyone's just getting along, then it, you know, it becomes essentially like friends where people are just sitting on a couch kind of making fun of each other. Mm -hmm. and then it, but even that's a little bit of conflict. So it, it just, they, they, they are afraid of, of, of rough edges, but humanity is all about rough edges. There was a show that we were talking about before uh, we came on stage tonight where basically the mandate was, if it's not funny, say it louder. Mm. And that just always seemed to be a really depressing thing that we did week after week on this show where, yeah, it was just sitting on the couch. No one really had any serious problems. But if you say it loud enough, then that tricks the audience into thinking that it's funny or something. Yeah, yeah. But, and I think that the audience has been tricked enough, and you see like kind of the the dearth of television comedy going on right now. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's not very funny, and it's not very good, and people aren't watching it in droves. Comedies used to be what people loved to turn to TV, and that's why people watch The Office eight or twelve or fourteen times over and over <laughs> again. I know, I know, half of you are guilty for that, <laughs> because honestly, there's just not much else great on TV right now. There's yeah. not many other like comedies that that hold up or that, you know, demand your attention. The dramas are great. I mean, mm -hmm. there's new dramas and the streaming services are uh, unbelievable. I just started watching last night this one, this Danish one called The Rain on Netflix. Did anyone start watching that? That was, it's so great. I mean, it's, it's flawed, but it's really cool. And this stuff's coming from all over the world, you know, science yeah. fiction and now that's what's um, so great about uh, streaming services now is that we can watch find these wonderful uh, kind of you know hidden gems from from other countries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I want to I'm, I'm I hope I don't mangle this uh, quote from from your book, but uh, in uh, in the Bassoon King you you write that creating art is a lot like worshiping God. Mm -hmm. um, could you? Talk a little bit more about that, expand on that a little bit. Yeah, so th the main reason I wrote the book, The Bassoon King, was because I really went on an artistic and spiritual journey, yeah. especially in my 20s. And I was raised a member of the Baha'i faith. And for those of you who haven't seen the Baha'i Temple or House of Worship in Wilmette on the lake, it's a really beautiful building you should go check out. Um, and I grew up a member of the Baha'i faith. My parents were Baha'is, and then I left it. Long story, very, very short. The, if you want the longer version, it's in the Bassoon King. <laughs> but the, um, I, uh, I, I left the faith to go be an artist in New York City. And that's really what I wanted to do more than anything. I wanted to be a bohemian and study art. And so I, I did, and I went to acting school, and I did all kinds of plays and all kinds of crazy experimental theater and just nutty, nutty stuff uh, for years. And then, you know, again, long story short, found my way back to my faith. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I discovered in coming back to the Baha'i faith, it was this, there's a beautiful series of teachings that I wasn't aware of that talk about how the making of art is the same as making prayer. And uh, the, uh, the son of the founder of the Baha'i faith, Abdul Baha, um, he, he said that you know the making of art is the same as prayer. That is to say, uh, when your fingers touch the paintbrush, it is as if you were on your knees in the temple. And I love that idea that uh, creating something, whether something beautiful or telling a story or something unique, like there's so many aspects of the spiritual, of the divine, of the transcendent 
in the creation of art. Being outside yourself. Being outside of yourself. You really, especially if you're doing it to serve someone else and it uplifts someone else. If you mm -hmm. write a great song and it's on the radio and it cheers millions of people's hearts, like that's a, that's a great service that you've provided. Um, if you're telling a new and original story that allows people to look at their lives differently, like that's a really a special thing to be able to do. Or to, even to make people laugh. Some of the most gratifying experiences I've ever had in my life are people, that, and it happens you know, every week, someone was like, my sister had cancer, but we would go to the hospital and we would all watch The Office together and we would just laugh and it would bring wow. us together as a family. And, yeah. and you don't think about that when you're on the set and you're just kind of tired and goofing off and just doing your thing and wondering when the next break is and what, what kind of food they're gonna have at craft service. But <laughs> it ultimately ended up being you know, a great service in terms of bringing joy and cheer to people's lives. And also the, the transcendent idea that if there is a creator that there was this blank canvas of the universe mm -hmm. and then there was this explosion and the Big Bang and there was the, all this beautiful, outrageous matter and molecules and energy that just spurred it out and became these galaxies and then this little mud ball became Earth and then we grew up on this Earth and then we're sitting in this little theater talking about film and, and about art and about super and, um, and about you know, and making things and discovering things, and the human animal has its, you know, its its particular journey in this universe. So when you're creating something, you're emulating the creator himself. When there's a blank piece of paper, mm -hmm. you know, when there's, you know, no film in the camera or nothing on the film in the camera yet, uh, and then you you end up creating a thing or a song or whatever it is, a poem. Um, that that's an emulation of the of the creativity of of life itself, and that's something that um, that you guys touch upon with Soul Pancake. Mm -hmm. uh, can you uh, there there are people in the audience that might not be that uh, familiar with with Rain's YouTube channel Soul Pancake. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about Soul Pancake and what its you know what its mission is, what its mandate is? Sure. So a bunch of uh, when I knew the office was going, a bunch of friends and I and uh, spoke about, we want to do, this was around 2009, we started having these conversations, 2008, and there wasn't much really cool or beautiful or wonderful on the web. It was kind of the worst of the World Wide Web. It yeah. was like Kardashians and credit scores was basically, <laughs> and, and used cars. It was kind of, and like those squeegee little chat rooms, you know, like yeah. it was, it was bad news. So we wanted to make something kind of cool and uplifting uh, for young people, and so we made a first that started as a website for life's big questions, um, Soul Pancake, um, and we wanted to chew on the big philosophical uh, and spiritual questions of life and the world, and um, uh, that was uh, that was really awesome. But it wasn't going, it wasn't growing the way we needed it to. And then we started doing actually for Oprah and some other places. We started doing some. Uh, uh, online videos, digital videos, and, and we found that we were much better at making content. So we transitioned from that website, we pivoted over to making um, uplifting, inspiring, and challenging content yeah. uh, for young people. Um, one of the most success successful shows we had was Kid President, so some people might know, you Kid, guys know President. Kid President. Um, some people might know Kid President and not know that Soul Pancake made it, but mm -hmm. we've done a number of different shows like that, and we have two and a half million subscribers on our YouTube channel. And we do a lot of work with brands and um, we're doing now live events. We published a, a couple books. and um, But it's all about um, challenging people with the big ideas of what it is to be a human being yeah. and inspiring and uplifting content. Um, and we were the first doing that. We were the first in that space before there was any Upworthy or A Plus or any of these other companies. Uh, that's but what we it, were doing. It's such a nice kind of breath of fresh air from uh, someone was talking the other day about how people seem to be going on the internet now I, I don't want to get political but um, people seem to go on the internet now to purposely kind of upset themselves to kind of rile their own cages by looking at whatever is you know trending or whatever a news article is is there and Soul Pancake seems to take such a wonderfully opposite approach towards humanity that way, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that that it is, like you you look at, you 
watch, go through videos of Soul Pancake, if for 20 minutes, guys, and it just, it, it just makes you have a more optimistic feel of the world. Mm -hmm. it, it just changes your, your headspace in, in so many ways. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, I was listening to Russell Brand's podcast and he had this great, this incredible documentarian named Adam Curtis mm -hmm. on. And if you guys haven't seen any Adam Curtis films, you should check him out because he's really revolutionary out there documentary filmmaker that um, explores the, the biggest questions of, of politics and economics and, and media and the yeah. intersection between all of them. And he was talking about how we live in this culture of outrage, like you talk about yeah, people Yeah, the culture going, of outrage. And, yeah. it, and it is, it's, um, so political parties have learned that if you're outraged, it, you, it, you're activated, and you'll, you'll click more if you're outraged. Mm -hmm. So if you just go onto any news site or something, it's gonna have articles about just outrage, whether you're left or right. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you go to certain left, leaning places, they'll have certain things like, what, how dare they click? <laughs> what, they did that click? How, I can't believe they click. And on the right too, it's like, what, Hillary Clinton did what? Click, uh -huh. you know, and people are, um, and it's essentially just to get more eyeballs and more, make more advertising dollars. It's all so, empty calories. So they, yeah. they cultivate outrage to make money. Yeah. So when you are outraged on the web and clicking on these articles, you're just feeding right into the beast. You're just feeding into this, you know the 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 economic uh, 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 bullshit. There are certainly things to be uh, outraged about. Mm -hmm. Certainly, there's injustice um, that one should be outraged about. And but we have to pick and choose our battles, and and then know where to put that energy because then it becomes just a circle of outrage. Yeah. And then you share it on Facebook, and your friends are outraged, and someone disagrees, and you outraged at them, and then you're outraged back and forth, and you're going, they send you a thing, <laughs> that outrage, and it's just, it's just people like, ah! It's a vicious circle. In, the, in these circles, end. yeah. Uh, there's a really, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a moment of outrage. It's, it's a shocking uh, moment that you write about in The Bassoon King. Um, that really stuck with me where um, uh, rain was mugged in New York uh, in the early it was late eight, Late 80s. Late 80s. 88. Uh, it was your, yourself, your friend, and your wife? My girlfriend at the time. Your girlfriend? Yeah. And the thing that, um, at least this is the thing that just really has, has been tough to kind of, you know, uh, move past is uh, it wasn't just the mugging, but Rain writes about the reaction to people who are his neighbors, to people that witnessed this mugging. Mm -hmm. would, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot again, but would you mind talking a little bit about that? Yeah, there was, um, I had witnessed this kind of, I, I will say gang, but it wasn't really like a gang, like Crips and Bloods gang. It was just a a roving band of teens and preteens that were just going out wilding and just yeah. doing damage and tipping over trash cans and throwing rocks at cars and go and I had I was waiting for my girlfriend because I would meet her at the subway station walk her home we were, we lived in a in East Harlem and um, it was a very dangerous neighborhood and this was you know during the crack epidemic it was not not a, a cool uh, time and I was always really broke on that poverty line so. Um, um, I had seen them like throw a guy onto the train tracks. Oh my God. Yeah. And so I was kind of like hiding in the back in the corner and then they had gone away and then she came out of the train and, uh, with my other friend. I was like, okay. I'm, and I didn't want to tell them about it because I didn't want to scare them. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, they seems like they're gone. I'll tell them later. We started to go up the stairs. We got to the top of the stairs and there was that same gang. I was like, oh fuck, this is going right to be bad. So we walked through them down the street and I was like, I'm not going to say anything. Maybe they'll leave us alone, and I'll just tell them later. Let's just get down the block. But I got whack. I got hit on the back of the head with a, a stick, a kid with a stick. And someone else threw a brick at my friend and turned him around and punched him. And they left her alone, but they just were out just being uh, just generally uh, violent and horrible. And so we started to run on down the street, and... Luckily, there was happened to be a cop car at the end of the street that we were able to get in, and um, uh, but yeah, there, there, it was it was really disheartening that there were 
people out on their stoops watching families that lived there and they were laughing you know they were laughing at this happening now, were these people that you had spoken to before no there weren't that people that i were? knew i lived a couple blocks from there but the i didn't faces you recognize not not really but i lived i think they knew that we lived yeah. down a block or two they knew that we lived up there mm -hmm. um and uh you know i think it was the other i think it was a mostly hispanic neighborhood and um we were kind of weird bohemians from downtown. We didn't really fit in there, so we were part of the other. And it's kind of like, yeah, kick the shit out of the people who look different than you. You know, it's like, you know, that holds up in a bunch of different ways. Although, you know, I was white, my friend was Hispanic, my girlfriend was Chinese. We were, you know, all the yeah. colors of the rainbow there. But um, it was, uh, and we were a Benetton ad. <laughs> uh, but we were... Um, yeah, it was it was really disheartening, and and then one other thing happened, and we got broken into, and then we're like, okay, f screw it, we have to leave this yeah. this neighborhood. But it was, but that was also like New York was kind of at its worst at that time. Right. Um, there was crack going on. There was still graffiti on the subways. It was, you know, it was uh, it was not a. There was uh, the the drugs and violence were really. It uh, wasn't the Disney store kind of town. Times yeah, Square and trust fund kids that it is today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So was that kind of like that complete lack of empathy or connect or sympathy for another human being? Was that event, did that somehow motivate you, uh, inspire you to create Soul Pancake? No, I don't, I don't think there's any connection there, but, you know, I think that that's... Uh, I think what you what you brought up is is super important, and you know I think that our job as artists and our job as human beings is to have as deep a compassion for other for the other as we can possibly have. So, and is that part of the the Baha'i faith? Like, is that kind of yeah, the... yeah? Certainly, it's part of the Baha'i faith. Um, um, to recognize the divine in every person that we're interacting with. Mm -hmm. To um, uh, to understand the outcast and to give love to the people that don't have love. Yeah. And um, it's, uh, but not just kind of, not a pity, like, oh, that, that must be so bad, that person is poor or something like that, but to, to really feel like, I, there but for the grace of God go I. I could have been born in that situation, you know. Yeah. I could have been born with a different skin color in a different economic circumstance that I was pretty lucky growing up in suburban Seattle, you know? Um, and as a white male, I have all this privilege that has come my way. And um, so just a deep, uh, a, a deep, like a kind of epically deep compassion for, for other people. So um, you, uh, I guess you co-founded uh, Lede uh, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's an educational initiative, empowering uh, young girls, young women through the arts and literature, uh, uh, who are living in Haiti. Yes. Is yeah. it in other countries now too? Or? No, it's just we're just working in Haiti right now. Mm -hmm. We do some workshops in some other places, but we're in Haiti. Yeah, my um, my, my I was involved with a. a I still am involved with a nonprofit called the Mona Foundation that uh -huh. supports uh, international schools around the world. And we were visiting some schools in Haiti and just fell in love with the country. It's such a rich, vital country. The arts are beautiful. The people are wonderful. The, the humor, the vitality, um, it, the culture is really, really interesting. Um, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a slave revolt that started the country. Yeah. So the slaves revolted on the plantations of the French, overthrew Napoleon and his armies and became its the second independent republic in the Western Hemisphere. So it has its own curious kind of West, West African Caribbean kind of feel. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's a really beautiful place. And two months later, the earthquake hit. Oh, God. So two to 300,000 people died over the, in the matter of minutes. Uh, the hotel that we had stayed at slid down a hill. Everyone inside of it was killed. Wait, um, you were there at the time? No, no. Two months later after oh, I two left. Months later, yeah, two yeah. months later. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we, um, we knew we had to do something. And uh, we um, uh, were then invited a few months later 
to teach a workshop with adolescent girls, doing an arts workshop for adolescent girls, and mm -hmm. we saw how powerful the work was. That art is not just about, you know, you guys would like to make a living or have a job or a career in it, but it also there's, there's a tremendous power in people getting together and making art yeah. together, um, and girls finding their voice. You know, we, we did this workshop, and one of the early times we'd had a getting to know you exercise, and we went around and asked the girls what their favorite color was, just as an icebreaker. And one girl said blue, mm -hmm. and then every single girl said blue. And we kind of realized, like, oh my God, no one has ever asked these girls what their favorite color is before in their lives. So, so were they just mimicking each other? Yeah, or? they're just mimicking each other. They didn't really have a favorite color. No one had ever asked them. That wasn't on their radar of like, wow. we could just tell in the way that they were responding. And girls, women and girls, the way they're treated in Haiti are really uh, subservient. They do all the work for the families. They do work in the fields. They do all the child rearing. They sell in the markets. They do all the shopping. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they're really subjugated. And uh, so we saw the power of the arts to um, help give them a voice. You know, yeah, and uh, so it wasn't just a cathartic experience for them; it was an experience in which they could express themselves for the first time. Yeah, and start to have a sense of their own identity, and that, like, oh, I have agency; mm -hmm. I have the ability to make change in my neighborhood, or change for myself, or the ability to get an education. And they would come together in these groups doing the art as well, and uh, it was. Uh, it created these little communities. They, after we left, they got together every week and they would do arts activities together and oh, wow. study together. And So now we're in 13 locations with about 500 girls. Around and, Haiti? Mm-hmm. And we, uh, we have a mobile computer lab and uh, a lending library. We do after-school tutorials. We do scholarships um, and uh, literacy programs as well. We also, also do health stuff. We have visiting artists come down and work with them mm -hmm. and we'll take them to the hospitals or help them with, you know, you know, birth control or whatever kind of issues they're having health wise. Um, so it's been a, a really uh, a phenomenal experience uh, to, to be able to do that. So we're going to uh, be opening the mic for uh, people with questions in, uh, in just a couple of minutes. Um, Rain, I wanted to ask you, you know, before uh, you came today, I was, uh, <laughs> I was just talking to uh, one of the professors here whose uh, daughter is here, who I think is in seventh grade, who's wearing a, um, a Shroot Beat Farms shirt. And uh, I was talking to my folks uh, last week about, you know, you coming. And there's something about the office that just, it, it, it's this amazing phenomena where, you know, kids in middle school, people in retirement communities just love this show. Um, in your book, you, again, forgive me if I'm paraphrasing this too much, uh, but you and Dan Harmon, who came and spoke uh, at DePaul, both touch upon um, that, that in watching the show, it's kind of like being part of a family. Mm -hmm. Like the view, it's sort of the viewer being a part of the family. Um, is is that? Do you believe like that's the secret to the longevity of the show? That people are just as passionate about the show now as they were, you know, when the last episode aired. Is there? Do you, do you have a, a a certain you know idea of like what what makes this show such a phenomena? Yeah, I think any television show that is successful creates a family mm -hmm. that you like to go back to time and time again. Yeah. You know, even if it's a drama, you want to go be with, you know, The Sopranos, you know, uh -huh. or whatever. Uh, it, 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 there's, there's something comforting about, about that. Um, even, you know, friends, they're a, they're, they're a family. You know, you, you, you want to spend time with them. There's mm -hmm. something about yourself that you recognize in them. And uh, I think that's what Greg Daniels, I really owe it all to him, our, our creator and showrunner and main writer. Um, he was really good at that. I mean, he's really good at picking talent um, of actors and also writers and uh, creating a, a, a really great working atmosphere. Um, but, uh, and also, 
you know, balancing the absurd humor with those with those few moments of of true human connection. Yeah. That, um, you know, uh, the show, The Office is ninety percent silly comedy, but that ten percent that grounds it, the real moments of of heart connection, is what people keeps people coming back, and that's what mm -hmm. so many shows are missing today, and they're afraid. I don't know if the networks are afraid or the showrunners or the writers are afraid to have the quiet moments. Those the quiet moments, the human moments, the the subtler moments um, that you're able to do on a single camera comedy, but that's I think what keeps draws people back. You know, they, they yeah. love the characters and you know, people like now because of Netflix, you know, there's a whole generation of kids that don't even know that NBC exists <laughs> as, as an true. entity. They don't, wouldn't know, you say what's NBC, they're like, I think that they show football on it sometimes. <laughs> like, I, they wouldn't, but on net, because of Netflix, they wa mm -hmm. they've watched The Office, you know, five or six times, all 198 episodes, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, we have our, our first question. Here's the questions you're not allowed to ask. <laughs> what was your favorite office episode? <laughs> what bear is best? What bear is best? Um, what was your favorite prank? And what was it like working with Steve Carell? Those are those are the four. Those are my four ones that I get every time. We're just gonna like. Skip Everyone those is less. Left. Okay, uh, I'll put my office or my office questions aside. Sorry, sorry if I can't also, articulate this. Also, one well. question, so you don't go like I have a couple questions and like. <laughs> no. you get one, one question. Yeah, there are one no question. follow ups. No follow ups. One question. Okay. First of all, I just wanted to say you know, thank you for everything. That's not a question. Uh, okay. <laughs> Never mind. Security. <laughs> Never mind. All right. Um, but uh, I mean, you're an actor, and I, you know, I'm an aspiring musician, so we're in different fields with this, of course. But I feel like when you're working as an artist, there's this kind of relentless ambition that you need to succeed and. There's, uh, I, I, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but I find myself comparing myself to a lot of artists my age and thinking, you know, why am I not where they are right now? And I, uh, sometimes it gets difficult and it gets hard. And I was wondering if you had any advice for self-doubt as an artist, you know, in any sort of creative field and how you push through that and how you network and seek opportunities and get to that level and yeah. build that's, your career. That's a really, that's a really great, Question. Thank you very much. Thank for you. I tried. That's a very, uh, <laughs> uh, I would guess I would say um, Black Bear is best. So uh, <laughs> uh, no, the um, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, I. So I always say to people who talk about being an artist, I always say like, if there's anything else that you can do and you can do and be happy, you should absolutely do that yeah. other thing, because. <laughs> There's just no guarantees. There's there's plenty of actors that I went to school with that I worked in New York theater with back in the day, um, just as talented as me that just didn't happen to luck into a TV show. I'm not like a better actor than them. I just got somehow, and if you read my book, you see I've kind of stumbled in, in, in sideways into it. Um, but if the, the art is something like you, you have to do it and you can't imagine your life not doing it. I mean, that's you have mm -hmm. to be in that place in order to be an artist. And yes, that creates a certain drive and a certain ambition. Um, and I guess the self doubt is, um, y you know, it, it, the stakes have to be life and death. And if they're life and death, then that keeps you going. I know this sounds kind of like pretentious, really, but um, it's kind of true because what else can sustain you for the five to 10 to 15 years it takes to establish a career. You know, I had been acting, let me see, The Office started in 2004, right? And I had been, I got out of graduate school in 1989. So 15 years later, I got on The Office. Wow. And, you know, I was pretty much making a living as an artist, but really, I mean, barely, barely for years. Mm -hmm. So. What kind of sustains that drive to, to do that? Um, uh, and I think that if you think of it, if, you, if you're able to go back to a, a higher purpose, that will often help you. Like what is, 
What is it that you have? What gifts have, has God given you? What gifts have the universe given you that you have that no one else has? And how do you need to share that? How do you want to share that with people? And, you know, it also takes, it also takes a certain awareness. Um, you know, are you in it for the right reasons? Are you in it for fame? Are you in it for accolades and status? Um, because that, those things may never come. You know, you may not ever get fame or accolades or status, and you have to be okay with that as well. And you also have to have the wisdom to know if you're any good or not, you know? Um, uh, you know, I, I have a friend in L.A. who's been, you know, 10 years of acting, and the m biggest job he's had is like three lines on CSI, you know, and just keeps trying, like, I just got to get a better agent, I just got to get a better agent, yeah. like, and trying and trying and trying, and it's just not, it's not happening, and I've kind of hinted to him, well, maybe there's something, maybe what if you taught? Like, oh, I can't teach, that's what losers do. I can't <laughs> teach. I'm like, no, and teaching is, a, is the most noble profession there is. You're, you're engaging hundreds or thousands of kids to go on, a, on an amazing journey, and it's a, it's a tremendous service, and well, neither of us would be here if it wasn't for the great teachers that we'd had along the way. So that's a little bit, I don't know, that's all oh, I got. Thank you so much. Mm. Yeah, I really appreciate it. All right. All right. Go away. <laughs> All right. Oh, boy. It seems to be something where, you know, like, the craft chooses you. You don't choose it. Yeah. That, yeah, like you said, like, you'd be just as happy being a plumber than, you know, there's excellent, you know, dental in plumbing. Well, so many people go to film schools and they want to be, everyone starts and they want to be a director. I want to be a director. Mm -hmm. And then if you find yourself editing and you just love editing, like, it's a great profession. It's yeah. a great job. It pays great. It's really interesting. You work with terrific people. You really help tell a story. And if you can make a living as an, ed as, as an editor, mm -hmm. um, that's, a, that's a great way to go, you know? That's a, it's... You know, there's or after effects or post or, you know, or development or, you know, physical production or, or any of those things. There's a lot more jobs. Oh, my God, yeah. So, yeah. Hi. Um, I'm that one actor. Um, I uh, just was wondering, since you've had such a vast career and such a diverse career, um, what skills you may kind of carry with you? Because you just did, you're at Steppenwolf right now, one of the most prestigious theaters in the city. And um, then you just did the Meg and everything, and it, which is going to be a huge blockbuster. You know, so what type of skills would you bring from all of your experience in theater back to film and television and then back to theater, something that you carry with you to kind of translate through different mediums but are always acting mediums, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, no, it, um, so at its core in acting, you are transforming yourself into a character and that character is helping to tell a story. And ultimately, I just love that act. I love that act of transformation. I love like there's words on a page. Here's, here's me, you know, and, and then there's these words on a page. And my job is to bring them to life and make the character believable and interesting and help to tell the story in a larger context. And whether that's on a soap opera, my first on-camera job was three days on a soap opera where I played Casey Keegan, the homicidal stand-up comic, <laughs> um, on One Life Your to best Live, role. and uh, typecast, and <laughs> a role I was born born for, or whether it's that, or whether I played Hamlet in, in grad school, or whether I'm playing the the billionaire, eccentric billionaire in the Mag or Dwight or whatever. I love taking this stuff and then making it this other character, and that. I hope that when I die, they'll show like some of the characters that I may played and the moments that those characters had and you know photos and scenes from them. Like, oh, so there was there was rain, but really there were these 87 other different people that yeah. that came out of his body, his imagination, his humor, his life experience, his his the way his language and stuff like that. So it doesn't. It's all about training that um, that ability to 
create a character and, and bring it to life. Being the opposite of the Harrison Ford writer, being open to right. all roles and right. experience. And there are certain actors that are kind of the same in, in, in everything. Yeah. Um, and, and they're good. You know, Tom Cruise is great at what he does. I like going to Tom Cruise blowing up spies in Berlin movies. You know, I, I do. And he's not transformational as an actor. He has a different kind of role. But that's, mm -hmm. that's not what I'm addressing. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Um, so for the past 12 years, I've had a YouTube video making camp at my house with a bunch of little kids. And um, kind of like what you were saying, it's, I feel like it's been very empowering and just fun. But we're all amateurs. I don't intend to be a director in any way. And I'm not trying to get the kids to become professional actors, but we just have a good time. And so I'm wondering if you have any ideas on overcoming camera shyness for kids who are just starting to do this? Yeah, so we, uh, any kind of self-consciousness is comes with the territory. So if you're on stage, like we're on, we're playing a scene, you know, here we are in Long Day's Journey and Tonight doing a scene and, and you, you start as an actor and you're aware of all these eyes looking at you mm -hmm. and you're like, hey, how's your water taste or whatever and you have that awareness and then when you're on the camera then you have then we're doing a scene and there's a camera right here and then it's like oh what's that camera picking up is that the one they're recording oh they have that mm -hmm. so that self-consciousness is is natural it comes with the territory so you kind of laugh at it understand it talk about it don't let it be like a bugaboo like it's just a it's just a, a thing in the you know uh, it's a reality of of acting and you know, I talked about intentions and intentionality. And if you pick up a Stanislavski book or Uta Hagen, I don't know whose acting teacher books are out there these days. But <laughs> if they're playing an intention, then they get to focus on that intention. It takes away from your self-consciousness. So if my intention is to get him out of the room, like I was talking about, right. I'm like, Chris, get out of the room or whatever. Then I'm focused on that, and I'm not worried about you know 200 eyeballs looking at me. So I would say to play with those intentions. And you'll have, m it, it, the self-consciousness will still come back. I'm doing the play at step one. Sometimes I'm like really aware of like, oh, there's this whole audience that's looking at me right now. <laughs> Is this any good, what I'm doing? Is this work, should I be doing something different? And I'll have a moment and you, you know that that's gonna come and you just let it go. How and then, long is that moment? Um, anywhere from three seconds to 40 seconds or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> But then it goes away, you know. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. I was informed not to speak until he stepped away. Um, so my question for you is, um, uh, I, well, I'm a screenwriter, and I was wondering what the perfect role would be to write for Rain Wilson in order to come back to television. <laughs> <laughs> Can you bring Casey Keegan back, the homicidal stand-up comic? Writing it down. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, no, I'm developing a show right now on AMC, a uh, science fiction show to star in uh, that also has dark comedy elements in it. Um, so I don't know if it's going to get made. We're, we're writing the pilot right now and stuff like that. There's a long process that would ever go. But there's other things I'm exploring. I'm not so interested in just going back and doing a... a half hour TV comedy on a network because I did 200 of those episodes. So um, what about a um, someone who used to be dead and they're a Frankenstein person mm -hmm. and but they have another person living inside of them. Okay. And they're a former hitman <laughs> but now <laughs> teaches in a inner city school. Great. Okay. I'll have the pilot Let's for you by tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, as an aspiring thespian, I go to the theater school. I'm really intrigued by your experimental black box studio days uh, and how that transfers, all that stuff. And so I was wondering what your relationship with audience engagement is. What does it mean for you to get the laugh you know, in the moment on the do in the doppelganger or get the hmm in Hamlet 20 years ago versus 
hearing at the grocery store a week later by someone that you got the laugh? How does that, how do you respond to that as a performer? Oh, yeah, great question. Yeah, there's, to me, theater is kind of the most noble of the arts because <laughs> it's the most ancient. And, you know, now we're sitting in this dark cave of this theater having this conversation. Well, our ancestors 100,000 years ago were sitting in a cave like this. And at the front of the cave was the shaman who was acting out the stories of the gods or the stories of the day's hunt or the stories of the of the mythology of the of the tribe or making fun of people in the tribe and their fart noises or whatever <laughs> it is that shamans were doing and there was a there wasn't a line drawn between the shaman being a performer and being a, a mystic or a priest in some way so there's something really beautiful and ancient about people in a room watching a performance and someone pretending to be someone else and having that interaction and getting that immediate feedback. There's something uh, really uh, primal and, and, and beautiful about that. And I always say like the most incredible works of theater that I've ever seen will all, always be my very favorite things that I've ever seen. And I even better than seeing The Godfather or Star Wars or something like that, when you see great theater, it stays with you like on, in a visceral way for your whole life, even m way more than your best film or TV. Um, the problem is you gotta sit through a lot of bad theater to get to the good theater and there's nothing worse than bad theater. When you, I know you've been dragged to a friend's play and, <laughs> and, and people don't know what to do with their hands and, and, and it's just awful and it, you have to say, hey, good, good job up there. Um, but when you see those really great works of art plays, it's a, uh, it's it's a really uh, magical experience. So, uh, yeah. So well, what was you. that play for you? What was that one production that you saw that took your breath away? Well, I tell you, uh, the great I've seen a number of them. I so Ingmar Bergman is a film director. I don't know if anyone studied any Ingmar Bergman films in your classes. If you haven't, then uh, it's, yeah. Yeah, uh, so he was a great Swedish director. He started in the, uh, in the theater and he did a bunch of films that were world famous, considered one of the top five directors of all time. And he did, he directed Hamlet in Swedish. It was three and a half hours long. I saw it in New York oh, wow. in, the, in the Swedish. And um, it was uh, the most incredible play that I've ever seen. Um, do you speak Swedish? No, I do not speak <laughs> Swedish. I think they had a little runner thing, like they have in operas where you could kind of read it, but oh, I, sure. I mostly didn't pay attention to that. And just I knew the play, so I was just watching it. And it was at the end of Hamlet, so this was directed by a 72-year-old man, and at the end of Hamlet, um, Fortinbras comes in, and the army comes in, and they all had AK-47s, and they took everyone and they gunned them down, oh. and then they opened a hatch in the stage, and they threw everyone in this hat. I mean, I don't know how they did it. They just literally hoisted them and just threw them in. And then the camera crews came in, and Fortinbras' last speech was right into the camera, and it was just like, it was so powerful. There was blood everywhere. It was like this incredible, and then the, the play was done, and like everyone stood up, mostly non-Swedish speakers, just shot to their feet, 1,500 people, and just like, ah! I mean, it was just, and that wasn't just the only great, there were tons of amazing moments, but when we're doing the doppelganger, we were, it's a new place, we were working on it, and I was like, the ending wasn't quite working, and I shared this story of this uh, Ingmar Bergman uh, Hamlet, and like, oh, we need something like that, we need to like, <laughs> just like, blow the roof off, uh, have this like, and, and we were all on the same page. I wasn't, it wasn't like my idea. The, me and the director and the writer were all talking about like, we need to just raise the level of it. And so that was, that was one example um, in a way that theater can be really revolutionary and, and provoke like awe, you know, and gasps in a way that. Um, so the experience in doing a show, is this the first time the doc the doppelganger has been yes, this is a world premiere. Uh, the experience of doing a a world premiere, as opposed to uh, a revival of something, mm -hmm. um, do you have a preference? 
Uh, I don't have a preference. They're both great. Um, if you're doing a revival of something, it's a, it's a proven entity. If you're yeah. doing The Glass Menagerie, you know it's a great play and it's just gonna work. Just find your way to make it work. Mm -hmm. With the new play, it's a lot more work because you have to, you know, we our first script was like 135 pages long. So we had to cut like 15, 20 pages out of the play. and try other jokes and other bits. So we're not only rehearsing a play, we're also making edits and trims and shifts to the play as we're rehearsing it. So it's a lot more work. Um, but it's really fun and exciting to be a part of something new like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, uh, you spoke a little bit on sort of uh, improvising and being sort of just like free flowing as a director um, when you're shooting a scene. Uh, but I was wondering, um, just sort of as an actor, especially working in, in comedies over the years, um, where do you find that line for yourself between wanting to run with something and improvise with it um, and also sticking to the source material? Yeah, there's, there's a constant give and take of that. Even on The Office, they always insisted that we get every scene exactly as written and exactly as the writer wanted it. So we make sure we go into the editing room and we have that. Um, then we could also uh, go off script a little bit. We could improvise and see what happened. Um, it was a great, one of the great ways of shooting the office like that mm -hmm. was you could just, you know, allow a scene to have its own life and rhythm. And you got two cameras kind of covering things and you could just see where it goes, you know. It's hard to do that when you're over one person's shoulder and all the lights are over here. <laughs> <laughs> and then you turn around, and then 50 minutes later, the camera's here and all the lights are back here. It's hard to have that same interplay and interaction. So was continuity kind of a problem on The Office? No, because, because you had that, all that coverage. You, know, yeah. you just had cameras doing this all the time. So, yeah, the, okay. so it's, okay. uh, it's, continuity is much harder when you're shooting one side over the other side, um, onto the other side. Uh, so there's a constant balance between that. You know, even on the mag, I would improvise lines and you know, try things, and that's the director's job. You had mentioned earlier, and I didn't really get to address it, um, about tone, mm -hmm. and Jason Reitman said that to me, too. He said that the, the director's main job is to make sure that everybody is in the same movie, and you'll yeah. see that when you see a movie and you see someone's, someone have a really broad performance and someone have a really understated performance, and they, they just don't seem to be in the same world. Mm -hmm. How do you keep everyone in the same, in the same world? And uh, that's that's a really important thing. So that that's the director's uh, um, job mostly is to uh, is is to make sure that uh, um, you're getting the spontaneous stuff you need, but you're also getting the scripted stuff you need. That and I think balance. and I think that you know there's that old adage that the um, uh, a film is made three times. So it's made when it's written on the script, and it's made when it's shot, and then it's made in the editing room. Yeah. But I don't think people trust the editing room enough that you can make a film in the editing room. And so it's really making sure you have everything you need for the editing room is really, I think, the director's job. Like, and let's do the crazy take, let's do that take the actors want to take, let's do the understated take, let's just do the, like the basic take, let's, um, let's you know, try something out of the box. And if you've got the time, mm -hmm. it's great to get in an editing room and go, wow, there's too many choices here. This is fabulous. It, when you get in an editing room and you're like, that's what we have to work with? <laughs> it's like, oh, I have three takes on each side and they don't seem to be listening to each other and it just feels stilted and where's my master? And, and nothing matches. And, the, and, and it doesn't match and why this is out of focus and it's like, you're like, oh my God, it's horrible. <laughs> It's torturous. So you have to trust, you have to have enough confidence. The director has to not be so controlling, like right. I said, all these decisions, but not be so controlling that they can't then allow for gooey, rich, lots of diverse stuff to be brought into the editing room and the director and the editor to, to find the piece together. You know, it means more time in the editing room, but that's where you make the film is in the editing room. Well, Rain, um, we've got a lot of uh, people from various uh, backgrounds in, in producing, directing, writing who are here at DePaul that are about to be uh, 
embarking on uh, a trip to either LA or New York. Um, could you leave us with uh, any parting words of wisdom? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the old New York, LA, or stay in Chicago uh, conundrum. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't know, like if you're a screenwriter or if you're a, a, a director, you know, I don't really know the differences. I know as an actor, I'll speak first as an actor and then I'll give you my hunch on the other stuff. So I am very biased towards New York actors and Chicago actors for that matter. To, to actors that are in it to really learn a craft yeah. and to challenge themselves and to grow. And they're not, um, I remember when I first moved to LA, I took this sketch comedy show that I was doing with some friends and we brought it to LA. And then so we, Bozina? the new Bozina, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we hired an intern to work backstage. And it was this kind of handsome little kid. And he was like, it was like, and he had just moved to LA. I'm like, oh, so you moved to LA. Why, why, why'd you move to LA? He's like, I want to be an actor. And I was like, oh, did you do acting in college? No. <laughs> did you do acting in high school? Nope. And he's like, oh, why? So why do, why do you think you're an actor? And he's like, I look really cool with a gun. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be on a cop show. And, uh, and that's a little bit more of the spirit of LA is like the people who look good with a gun who want to be on a cop show and aren't really there for the craft of, um, of being an artist. And New York is much more in the realm of exploring one's art is much more uh, appreciated there. Um, that being said, like, well, you're you're started as a comedy writer, and you know, m most of the comedy writing happens in L.A. Ninety yeah. percent of it. I mean, it'd be great to go to New York and do Upright Citizens Brigade and meet with some friends and write some sketches and have a YouTube channel and you know take a playwriting class and you know do that for a couple of years. It would be a great experience, but ultimately you are going to need to go to L.A. And if you want to be in the development office and read scripts and work your way up that way, you got to be in L.A. Stuff that's like where that. the writers' rooms are. That's where the writers' rooms are, exactly. So it's um, it's a tough question. I would say no matter where you go, that you have to continually hone your craft, you know, and you have to constantly uh, work to make yourself a better and better artist. You can't you can't ever you can't ever settle, um, and you need to challenge and stretch yourself. I mean, not to toot my own horn, but like this play that I'm doing is is killing me this thing is so hard <laughs> it's so hard it's two hours and 15 minutes long i'm on stage the entire time it's pratfalls it's tons of lines it's sword fights and quick changes and physically running up and down stairs and um it's just brutal and it's it's a farce comedy is really hard but then farce is even harder than regular comedy because it's so precise it has to be really precise yeah. and but i am proud of myself that i'm challenging myself to go even at the age of 52 to go to challenge myself and to do more and more difficult things. So you have to, don't think that your degree at DePaul gives you an entree to this stuff. That's, you've, you've just scratched the surface. I mean, when I got out of NYU, I had just scratched the surface. Mm -hmm. And um, so you have to go on that, that journey of exploration to, to hone your craft. And the more you can connect your craft to the world, I think the better to like, why am I doing this? Why do people need this? Why do people need my skills? Why do people need stories? Why do people need these stories? Um, and to, you know, to stick to your, to find your greater mission. That will, that will feed you yeah. over the long term. Let's give a hand to Rain Wilson.